throughout the day, various women in science had shared about their passion for STEM. And to wrap up today's webinar, we have arranged for a very special dialogue session with four invited panelists. This session is moderated by Dr. Kirutika Ramanathan, De Deputy Director, Schools and Professional Development and Technology Science Centre Singapore. Take it away, Dr. Kirutika. Hello, everyone, and good evening, and welcome to um, the panelists. Uh, the panel session as part of Discover Her, uh, which celebrates the International Day of Women and Girls in Science right here at Science Centre Singapore. Uh, today, we are thrilled to have with us four panellists who have shown in their fields of science, technology and engineering. Um, without further ado, I would like to bring um, on board our first panellist for today, um, and that is Dr. Sandhya Sriram and she is the CEO and co-founder of Shiok Meats and an enthusiast to bring cell-based crustaceans into the market. Hi, Sandhya. Welcome to the show today. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Kiro. Happy to be here. What, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit more about what this is all about, cell-based crustaceans? What on earth is that? <laughs> Sure. Um, so yeah, I run a company called Shiok Meats that basically works on cell-based seafood and meats. Um, what we mean by that is recently, you, I mean, most of us would have heard about how the meat industry and the seafood industry is undergoing a lot of issues with regards to overuse of antibiotics, to the whole need for more protein in the world because we are a growing population. Um, you know, ethics in animal welfare and so on. So there are a lot of issues around the meat and seafood industry that um, are in a uh, cell-based meat industry kind of answers to. So what we do is we produce real seafood and real meats, but instead of growing an entire animal and then slaughtering it to get your meat and seafood, we just use stem cells to grow the meat. So this is actually environment friendly because we use very less energy, water, land and resources. Um, animal friendly because you don't have to kill animals and health friendly because we use no antibiotics or so no hormones. No, let's say for seafood, there's no microplastics, there's no heavy metals, none of that. So it's the same tasty, delicious, real meat that you enjoy, uh, but comes from a different source, which is stem cells. But at the end of the day, if you look at a piece of meat that you eat currently, it is actually made up of cells, tissues and stem cells. So we just grow the part of the animal that we eat. None of us eat the entire animal per se. So that's what cell-based meat is. That's fascinating. So if I'm a vegetarian and I don't kill the meat that I eat, can I still eat it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I am this type. So I've been a vegetarian all my life, but the reason for me being vegetarian is more ethical rather than anything else. So I do enjoy cell-based meats in the sense I don't have to, you know, have that guilt of killing an animal, um, you know, uh, get, you know, adding to climate change or anything like that. But our meats are not vegan or vegetarian. They are the real meat. So if you have been vegetarian for other reasons, then I would not be selling to you. Actually, we want to sell this to meat eaters. Yeah. All right. That's fantastic. Let's, uh, let's bring on board our next student chapter and women and a series. Oh, just give me a minute. All right. Okay. And Sirin was awarded the Singapore 100 Women in Tech in 2020. Um, hi, Sirin. Welcome to uh, the show today. Sirin, you're muted. Would you unmute yourself, please? <laughs> okay. Hi. Thanks for having me here. It's uh, very nice to see everybody again, including Sandhya. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Sirene, um, you've been a very successful person in the field of STEM. Um, you know, we have this long list of accolades that, that come after you when we Google your name. So tell us, why did you actually pursue a STEM field? <laughs> oh, I, I don't think I'm successful uh, <laughs> yet. Uh, I think there's always a lot of things to do there, but... Um, the reason I pursued STEM was very simple. I, I just liked it and I thought that I enjoyed being in STEM and so I, I just kept doing it since I was a young girl at the time, yeah. 
Awesome. Yeah. So let's now bring along our next panelist, um, who is Miss. Mohana Prabha and uh, Mohana Prabha has ha has a very interesting uh, background. She is the medical technologist for COVID-19 labs and she was also crowned the Miss Singapore Universe 2019. And uh, she is an advocate of diversity and is supported to draw attention to global warming. Um, hi Mohana Prabha, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you so much when for inviting I, when, me. When, when I read the I, I was so fascinated by your diverse background and I, I just want to ask you a question uh, before we bring our next um, um, panelist on board. So, you know, with, with such a diverse background, what support did you receive from the people around you to pursue both fields? <laughs> Um, that, that is actually a very interesting question. I think from a very conservative family background, I was always told to just pursue something that's very safe which is uh, the degree that I did attain. But at the same time, I feel like I do want to chase after my personal dreams and my personal goals. So while I'm at the age where I can, I still have the energy to pursue both. I just thought, why not, right? Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, and uh, last um, and last but not least, um, we bring our final panelist um, for today, and that is Associate Professor Kimberly Klein, who is the co-chair of Women at NTU and a researcher in the field of microbiology. Hi, Kimberly. Hi. Hi. Okay, so um, this is my opening question for you. So can you share with us um, a memorable experience that you have as you pursued your research in microbiology? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I would say one of my more memorable experiences when I is was when I first had my real lab research experience for the first time. So I think many of us that study science do lab courses as part of our education. But for the first time when I was able to get outside of the classroom and do research in a real live lab, I will never forget that time looking in a microscope, looking at the, the microbe that I happened to be looking at at that time, it was a complete revelation. And I completely fell in love with microbiology from that day forward. It's beautiful. So what were you looking at when you looked through the microscope the first time? Do you remember? <laughs> I think we lost Kimberly. Or... Okay. Um, hi, Kimberly. Are you able to hear us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Awesome. Yes, I do. So, Sorry, I just um, yeah. appeared somewhere. That's, that's all right. So, um, yeah. So I was asking you, do you remember what you looked at when you first looked through the microscope in your first experiment? I do. I definitely do. I was looking at the eukaryotic microbe Tetrahymena um, thermophila. I think that's what it's called. I haven't studied that in a long time. But wow. Yes, I do. <laughs> Beautiful. So, We never forget our first experiments or our first um, touch with with the um, real world. So, um, okay, so maybe um, maybe we'll start off with um, questions to um, both Kimberly as well as to um, Serene. So both of you are involved in the Women at NTU program. And um, so maybe you can share um, by telling us a little bit more about what kind of opportunities are available uh, for females in science um, in Singapore as well as the region. Go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> I can go ahead. Um, well, okay. Well, we are from the academic institution, so I think from the academic point of view, we have a lot of positions, well, uh, um, on be, having women in as a researcher, as a scientist, as well as an engineer. Uh, so those are opportunities that are available at the university. And we hire at all levels from uh, undergraduate researchers, which uh, if I, and then you have the master's level as well as PhD levels. And then we have also postdocs. And there are a lot of opportunities, but the opportunities are dependent, of course, on the availability of grants. And that's what we have, I think, from academic point of view. Um, Kimberly, would you like to add on to that? <laughs> yeah, sure. I think we're witnessing poor bandwidth at NTU right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, 
I, Siren's right. So, you know, there, there's so many opportunities for girls and women in STEM at the university across disciplines. I mean, really, you know, your imagination is where it ends. Um, so science, tech, engineering, medicine, across the board, and, and so many ways to contribute and, um, and get involved. And so, of course, that's just at the university. I mean, there's, you know, opportunities um, in, in all of those same disciplines from girls much sooner. Um, and that's a great avenue to get into those areas of research and science and engineering once they reach university. So um, it's, it's a fantastic thing to enter science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and it gives us a um, a kick, right? So, so when you're solving problems, you know, you get a little bit of a high when you do this. And, and as a scientist, we solve problems all the time. Um, and we see a lot of young women who are interested in, in STEM when they are in school. But, but for some reason, you know, somewhere something gets lost along the way, and not many of them pursue STEM careers. So first question is, um, you know, why are, are girls actually afraid of entering STEM? Um, if so, why? And, you know, how do we actually stop any fear from, from going through? Uh, maybe I can, I can uh, direct this question to Mohana to begin with, because you've just been, you've just graduated and, and you are in a STEM field. <laughs> um, I think... I can't really answer the question only because like the people that I've been surrounded by in school, uh, we've all been very passionate about what we've been doing, we're doing. So immediately after graduation, every one of us has been applying for jobs and a lot of us uh, are now medical technologists or lab technologists. And mm -hmm. I, just, I just think that we're just at, in a time where uh, women just have this fire to just break through our social norms and pursue what we've always wanted to um, and to not let society define us. So I really don't think I can answer the question as to why <laughs> females are scared. Maybe maybe because I'm just new to the industry still, but um, that's my take on it so far. Yeah. Awesome. So Sandhya, Sandhya, what do you think? Um, do you think that women are afraid of entering STEM or is there a innate bias in, in STEM fields for men to go into the fields? Um, I think it used to be that way, not so much anymore. We're definitely seeing, I think, you know, um, a lot of sessions, talks and career development uh, seminars are going out there. I mean, people like us go out there and speak. I was inspired by my previous female scientists, you know, and I'm trying to aspire to inspire the future generation, but uh, I think not so much. Um, I think we are all trying to break the norm and kind of um, do what we want to do. Um, I come from India where, um, you know, women, a, a certain percentage <laughs> of women or even majority of women um, are meant to be, you know, kind of married and have children and take care of the house. That's that's still happening in India, even though India is super forward thinking, it still happens a lot more. So we do see a lot of girls want to come out of that shell and tell that, no, I want to be educated. And we're, what we're seeing, interestingly, is where the, even after they get married, the, the husbands are the ones that are supporting their education. They're like, go ahead, your, maybe your parents didn't want to do it, they got you married, but are you interested in studying? Are you interested in working? And I'm happy to like support you. So we are, we are seeing those stories. So I hope, yeah, it gets much better for a country like India, but generally in the world, we are seeing a, a good progression of women going into STEM, yeah. So um, is this something that we see um, across the world? I know that we are um, in a very good place in Singapore where you know a lot of women, and women have equal rights or sometimes even better rights than men in, in, in some of these fields. But how about across the world? Um, you did mention that India is getting a lot more forward thinking. Um, do you or can, can the other panelists also share stories of um, your experience with the women from other countries? I, I could add here um, my perspective. So from um, outside of the region, you know, in, in Europe, I spent some time in Sweden and also in the United States. And I think, um, you know, the Scandinavian countries are famous for being very progressive in gender diversity. And, and that's, you know, visible in some ways. I mean, so there's lots of women um, in science and engineering there. 
Um, but you know, they see some of the same problems that we do, where it's, it's as women get higher and higher up in their career paths, that's where we start to see it really, uh, or they see a dropout. Um, and, and speaking to colleagues at very, very high levels in science and research and medicine in Sweden, they talk about the same challenges that there's that can just be difficult. Um, and and I'd say you know similar. Um, feelings in the United States, you know, I agree with what Sandia said, it is definitely improving. And in, I think in certain areas of STEM, it's much better than others. I think sciences and life sciences, you see a lot more um, diversity than perhaps in some of the, say, engineering or tech areas. And so I think, you know, there's, it's not, um, it's not similar across the disciplines. Right. Um so, so um, I mean, I'm sure all of you have your own stories on why you chose to enter a STEM field. And maybe we can start with Siren. Siren, your specialization is engineering. And we always think of engineering as a male dominated, um, you know, sort of a field. And when I was studying engineering, I was like the only girl in my tutorial group. So, so why did you choose to study engineering? And, and, you know, was it something that you felt an affinity to? Or, you know, uh, could you tell us more about why you chose engineering? What are you most proud of, of your accomplishments in engineering. Okay. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, it was a partially, I, I liked chemistry when I was uh, in high school and then I didn't quite like pure chemistry. I wanted to be applied. So the natural thinking was that, okay, maybe I can do chemical engineering where it's an applied science field and then can learn what, uh, uh, how do you actually realize uh, um, I'll take the engineering principles, et cetera, and then and apply that. Now, the thing that I didn't really know is that engineering was, was not chemistry. <laughs> it, it was a lot of physics there. <laughs> and sometimes, and you know, uh, uh, uninformed decisions could be a good decision at some point. But anyway, <laughs> so that's why I ended up doing engineering. But, um, but uh, you know, sometimes it's interesting because then you kind of push yourself and it was really not easy. Uh, but like it was not, uh, it was rather right foreign concept and then trying to understand applying that into flow in the pipe. I mean, like you can't really see that direct implications on what we are doing. But I, uh, looking back, I think that it was a lot of struggles actually for me uh, through engineering disciplines because it's, it's trying to think about uh, more of uh, the mechanics of things and how the equations all fit together into modeling a certain type of behavior or physical behavior that's mm -hmm. uh, uh, very challenging. But, um, but now that I've gone through that step and then looking back, it, uh, it, I can see how everything now fits in very well. And I'm kind of really glad that I went through that situation or through the, the training and then can, can appreciate and perhaps apply some of those basic understanding. I didn't become a chemical engineer at the end. I, I switched fields sort of into biomedical engineering, but that concept uh, from learning about the flow in the pipe, then I can apply that into the flow in a blood, blood vessels, for example, same principle, but then, yeah. So that was yeah, like sort of how I ended up being in right. engineering. Okay, um, I seem to have a slight internet issue here, but I guess uh, we'll, we'll, we should be all right. Um, I'm, I, I mean, I would like to sort of direct this question um, also to Mohana, so uh, what actually made you to choose a STEM field? Um, interestingly, or oh, maybe not. So in secondary school was when I realized like I was pretty good at science and math. Um, or rather I wasn't too bad at it, right? So I was pretty average about, it, about science and math. And I realized that the factual account and, and how you go about finding, finding, um, approving a hypothesis, right? I, I really like the concept of it. So after secondary school, I had applied for what I thought was a science-based course, which then I later realized it was an engineering course. And I then realized like engineering is just not my thing. So I had enrolled myself in technology so then that's what I, like i think similar to what she was sharing as well that it was the best thing in the 
disguise um that i then realized engineering is not my strongest subject or mathematics not from at least to say and then what i had also placed an internship in australia where i was assisting a phd student and also an honor student and i really enjoyed lab work and the trial and error and having to figure out what went wrong or um basically just the essence of experiment and conducting research i really enjoyed that because it's not the same day every day it's not the same thing every day and i i like being on my toes so that's how i knew this is the industry that i really enjoy and in a way that's that's sort of like the beauty of science and technology right if you if you if you feel that you're not quite suited for one area of of stem um it's always possible to pivot and go into another area and i think we heard that from siri and she she jumped yeah. chemical engineering to biomedical engineering and then we heard that from you as well and maybe we can uh maybe hear from kimberly so kimberly um you're doing something a little bit different from you know you're not doing engineering you're doing more pure i mean what i would classify as a pure science um so did did that was that a natural affinity for you from the time you saw your first bacteria under the microscope or did you go through any changes in your um uh, in your time as a scientist yeah you know as nerdy as that sounds i have stuck with microbes since day one i have <laughs> i've never even had the urge to think about pivoting to something else now you know in my tiny little world view of microbiology i feel like i've expanded and, and started to think of, about microbial interactions and disease in different ways but um it's certainly it's been pretty focused pretty linear for me in that way <laughs> uh, so maybe uh, sandhya would you like to share i mean what you have been describing sounds like a classic case of you know a uh, uh, switching um and and in having interfacing different kinds of um stem different fields of stem so could you share a little bit about your journey with us So interestingly like Kimberly for me it's always been stem cells so I've been with stem cells for right from my undergrad I think so that's the I don't know 7 15 years um yeah almost 15 years of stem cells but through stem cells I've moved from being a scientist to being a business uh, sort of a program manager and a business development manager for a stem cell institute or slash laboratory and then eventually started a company that works with stem cells so as you can see i am obsessed and love stem cells but uh, i decided to ch- just shift my career path per se so what i know very well is stem cells so i don't want to suddenly go into an industry that i don't understand at all um so started up from doing my undergrad masters phd in stem cell biology then was a research uh, scientist for quite a while you know working on stem cells for healthcare so more on human diseases how do you treat them how do you understand them uh, disease diseases like cancer and muscle wasting aging and all of that and then uh, over time kind of decided that i wanted to start a stem cell company some sometime in my life uh, in the next i would say 3 to 5 years this was 3 years back and um, at that point this was 5 years back and at that point i said um i want to start a company but i have no clue how to run one how to set up one um and i don't want to do the science anymore i i i i have the brains i have the knowledge transfer but i do, really don't enjoy bench work anymore um so i kind of stopped being a scientist per se in my hands uh, always a scientist in my head but uh took up business development where i kind of learned finance budget ip patents legal paperwork all of that that you need which is kind of the back end of science right so eventually you do the science you have a product how do you take it out of the lab and put it into the consumer's hands so i did that for a couple of years and in 2018 said okay now i know research now i know sort of science of so, you know the business of science and now it's the right time to like put both together and then eventually start a company that works on stem cells yeah so what was your biggest breakthrough <laughs> <laughs> my biggest breakthrough was realizing that i don't enjoy bench work anymore <laughs> um i have this thing which i say even to my team members my employees but i say the minute you wake up one day morning and you feel like you don't want to go to work and you are you are pretty much like oh my god should i go today um is the time that you decide to either quit that job or like find something else or change careers with something that you're super comfortable with so when i wake up 
uh, any morning feeling like, oh my God, should I go to lab today? Do I have to do cell culture? Do I have to look at cells? I know within the next six months, I want to change my job or my career. So I've, I've kind of listened to that has helped me kind of get to where I am right now. And at least for the la last two and a half years, I haven't had a single day where I've thought, oh my God, should I get up? Uh, every day it's like, when will I get up and when will it's beautiful. Um, you know, I, I mean, I'm always fascinated about the fact that STEM is such an interdisciplinary thing. And uh, we see this time and again, and, and we see it in, in some of the stories that you all have shared so far as well. I, Mohana, I just wanted to um, touch, touch base with you because you work in the COVID-19 laboratories. Could, and I, I'm sure that a lot of the people who are listening to us here today will be fascinated to know what actually goes on in these places. Would you be able to share a little bit more with us? <laughs> I think I can share the process. Uh, so I think ever since 2021 started, um, our sample load has increased by two times. So it's been a lot for us, I feel, to process everything and to meet the TAP turn, turnaround time. Um, but for the most part, it's just like what I've learned in school as, as to when we receive the sample, how we process the sample, and then we perform an extraction uh, procedure, which then uh, PCR will be followed after that. So it's inactive, the vi viral um, genetic code are all in, uh, inactivated, therefore it's pretty safe on our ends. And very often we work hand in hand with the engineers so just recently we had a soft software update whereby the time that it takes uh, in total had shortened by an hour. So that helps with the increase in sample load. So I, I think it's very interesting that it's a never ending process where there's always ways to improve. There's always ways to develop um, a better kit or a more precise kit. And I think that's the beauty of us, the STEM industry is that there's no end to it and there's always something to learn. Yeah. How many samples do you see on Lately, average day? In a day we've received up to 5,000. So, and, and our lab is a 24 <laughs> hours lab. So we, we work around the clock. There, there are two shifts. So that's pretty intense, wow. that's... <laughs> but it's very routine. I'm not gonna lie. and. And personally, it's not something I'll do my whole life. But for the moment while I'm bound, bound here, I thought that it's a good experience. It's a good way to start off in this industry, in my opinion. Yeah. So, you know, um, so again, you know, you're, you're a medical technologist with the COVID-19 labs, and you're also a Miss Singapore universe. And, and I would say modeling is like a very artsy kind of a field, at least to me. And, and uh, medical technology is a very sciencey field. So do you feel that you know um, science and art are, are somewhat related uh, can someone do both at the same time or can someone find a a, a place of balance For sure I think to be a scientist I think you have to be you owe it to yourself to be creative and not to be blinded by your own um, by your own what's the word am I looking for what's the word am I looking for uh, box <laughs> yeah yeah essentially by own box it's it's it we we always to ourselves think outside the box and not be blinded by our own agenda right because very often there there will be experiments that we conduct and we want to anticipate a certain kind of result but as history shown that's not always the case and sometimes like as scientists we do fail to see outside the box and i think that being creative would allow you to do that would allow you to to see your mistakes from the third point of view and rationalize better so I think being creative and being a scientist goes hand in hand. And I don't see why you should do one or the other for as long as you're, you have passion in whatever that you have, yeah. So uh, Siren, would you be able to add a little bit more to that? Because you have a lot of students at NTU, women who work, um, and, and you also run initiatives um, to get women to think a little bit beyond, you know, just the lab work. So would you be able to add a little bit more on, you know, where science and the arts might possibly meet? Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, I, I really like the approach that Moha, uh, Mohana, right? Yes, uh, view on, on these things. I think. They are not mutually exclusive to each other, but I think they converge. This is the beauty about uh, science and creativity that people are not very familiar with. I think 
that being a scientist is actually a very creative process. Uh, particularly for me, uh, creativity people have associate with with art for the most part, but that process actually is actually in, involved. A lot of that processes are involved in scientific discovery, engineering, you know, innovations and all these things. So then I think that the, the merging of art, artistic concept, even artistic processes into science and vice versa, I think is very important. And I'm trying to, uh, I, I kind of discovered art a little bit later in my life because I kind of did pretty badly <laughs> when I was in elementary school in art classes. But, you know, I think that being aware that it's there and then actually the process is very similar if we look at into the detail. Uh, being aware of that and then I think merging those two together uh, make it a much more fruitful and a very interesting pursuit, both scientifically and artistically. Yeah. Kimberly, I'm going to put you in a bit of a spot over here because um, recently I saw these, um, you know, beautiful uh, bacterial art that that comes out of petri dishes. They come all over Facebook, and and so that that makes me wonder: is is a field like microbiology? You know, um, you you would think of it as you look at. I would think of it more as you know, um, learn. I'm not I'm not a microbiologist. So I would think of bacteria as being bad stuff and you have to find out what to do to to keep them away and then you see these beautiful pieces of art that come out of it and you're like hey it's not too bad after all you know so <laughs> can you share a little bit more about um uh, generally microbiology um some you know if you have any insights about these art that comes out what do we learn from them other you know um do we learn to view microbes in a more friendly way <laughs> Yeah, you asked a lot of very interesting questions in that one question. <laughs> um, so, you know, maybe I'll just start to, to make a, a shout out to microbes, um, which is, you know, I think a lot of us think of microbes as just bad and they cause disease and they cause infection. But what we actually know is that we wouldn't be alive and healthy without microbes. The microbiome is essential. You know, those are the good guys um, and gals. And, you know, the in the environment, the microbes, you know, this, this helps make the world go around. We wouldn't have air to breathe if there weren't um, microbes. And so, you know, so I think that's the first uh, notion to dispel that microbes are always bad. They're um, beautiful in lots of different ways. Um, a different, you know, in, way to answer your question, just thinking about the beauty of microbes and these images that come out, um, is one of the really fun things about being a microbiologist. The technology we have nowadays to look at these microscopic organisms is incredible, and we can put colors on them, and we can look at all the little subparts of microbes. Microbes themselves are tiny, but we can actually look within microbes and look at what's going on, and we can see it. You know, with with uh, with these microscopes, and so um, so this is actually a very tangible way to see the invisible world, which I think is really fun, really beautiful, um, and it helps people understand how these microbes um, exist in our world. So um, for those of you who are dropping by at Science Center, I have to do the shout out that, you know, we have this little activity on viewing kombucha um, fungus. So if you're dropping over at Science Center as part of Discover over this weekend or the next weekend, uh, be sure to look out for it and you can take a look at, you know, um, friendly microbes. Um, okay. so, so there, um, so Kimberly, you, you struck a chord when you mentioned technology um, with respect to, um, you know, understanding microbes and, and learning more about them. And I would like to pass the question to, to Sunday now um so when in the work that you do um which is very stem cells and i think stem cells i mean i, I always thought stem cells are very bio thing you know um so it's a bench as you said and you said you left the bench so i would like to ask you what role has technology actually played um in you know bringing your work from the bench to more or less the bedside although i understand that the shook meats are really too expensive for any of us to afford right now <laughs> So next, next year, it'll be on your oh, that'll be great. So no, no, bed, no bedside then, it's okay. the dinner table. So that you don't have to go to the bedside. <laughs> you don't have to go to the hospital, eat healthy and clean. Um, I think, you know, technology has progressed so much that we would have never thought that we could make meat out of stem cells. So I think that itself answers the whole question of how technology has mm -hmm. progressed everything. I mean, another example is the whole COVID thing, right? The, the way we have used technology to bring out these rapid tests, the way we, the way we progressed using technologies just in a year's time from testing to 
uh, vaccines, right? So I think that whole thing shows how the technology is, how technology has progressed. I mean, like Kimberly mentioned, technology to see microbes is much better. That's the way we are able to identify these viruses and work with them and, you know, find out what they are and find something that kills them or takes care of them, you know? So um, it used to take 20, 30 years to make a drug or, or, or a vaccine. I think COVID has kind of broken those walls per se. Um, I, I don't have anything else to add. I think technology is the future. Um, tech doesn't mean just having a phone or an app or a, you know, so on. Tech actually means um, for us, tech, what tech is, is making life easier or making um, things faster in a sense where what might have taken two, three days to do a technology, uh, tech can make it like happen in two, three hours. So, you know, like Mohana just said, they have a new software that can just reduce by one hour, a reduction of one hour actually sounds very less, but it's actually very, very important uh, when you're doing large scale testing or large scale manufacturing or whatever it is. Yeah. Awesome. So um, I have a question for all of you, actually, I'll just maybe go down in the order. Um, you know, we, we spoke about science, we spoke about technology engineering. Um, what about mathematics? I know, could you share a story of how math has influenced or, you know, has, has sort of, you know, math, I always find that math is an unsung hero. Everyone uses math, but no one really talks about it except in the conference papers. And then everyone switches off and just shows the equations in a slide in, you know, hopefully. Not. So, um, so, so maybe we can start with Serene. Could you, could you share a little bit more about um, how math has played a part in your life? <laughs> Uh, Siren, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, math is uh, in our lives all the time, right? We calculate all the time. But I think what math with uh, in my higher order mathematics, uh, particularly, I would like to highlight my my field. And uh, we are nowadays we know the sequence of COVID nineteen very quickly. And how does it actually compare with the other ones? And how does that actually mutations happen? So all these things. That basically is by comparing one sequence of, of DNA and then another sequence of DNA. And nowhere for us to be to enable that, if we were just looking at a short piece, this is okay. It's easy for you to look at it by the eye. But if you have thousands and thousands of, of these letters, how do we do that? Right. So that's where mathematics really comes in. And I think that is very important to, to understand that it's it's the mathematical tools that we, we use and come up with again equations, but then the applications of those equations is basically enable us to compare different things very quickly and coming up with, with uh, um, the, the mutations on COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 virus, for example. So that is uh, the realization of use of mathematics in health. Um, there are many other examples. I think that's probably I let the other panel members to. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, Kimberly, would you like to add on to that? Um, what's your experience of mathematics in your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I echo what Siren says. We deal a lot with sequencing data and imaging data. And these are massive, massive data sets. And to analyze them, you need math, you need statistics at very, very sophisticated levels. Um, you know, you need special training to, to, to really do it. And so we do those sorts of things in my lab. And for me, math, not studying more math is a great regret in my life because I wish I understood the underpinnings of a lot of these mathematical processes better. I took two semesters of calculus uh, in college and I wasn't required to take any more for my biology major. And so I, for no good reason, stopped taking math. And I always regret that. I would love to go back and take more university math at some point in my life because I really enjoyed it. So to the girls listening, <laughs> if you like math, don't give it up just because uh, you know your major or your, your, your curriculum doesn't require it necessarily. Mm. All right. Mohana, would you like to add on to that um, and share with us your experiences with mathematics? <laughs> um, I guess similar to Pa. Uh, for my lab, so my company has various labs and for my lab, the, the test kit that we use requires us to, to analyze the data. So with other labs, they, the, the data is already analyzed. So it's either binary, positive or negative. For us, we have to see um, the, IC, the, the, the IC value and see if it coincides with the, the gene that's been amplified and all that. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of, <laughs> 
analysis, considering that we process 5,000 a day. And, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, we still have to do it. So sometimes there'll be error, but luckily I have like teammates that would double check these analysis. So it's not, it's not, math's not something that one person should know and the whole team can go, can move forward with it. Everybody should know. And it's not something that I was prepared for <laughs> coming into the real world. Cause like I was <laughs> much more enthusiastic about the biomedical science aspect and not, not the mathematical aspect of it, but it coincides, it's necessary. So have to have to learn what I gotta learn. I do enjoy it. Not looking forward to it, but I do enjoy it. <laughs> so, so in a laboratory setting uh, such as yours, how much of this analysis is done by the computer and how much is um, required to be done by humans? Um, so the numbers are tabulated by the computers. We just have to see because some, sometimes from time to time, the requirement is different from the management when, when information is passed down to us. So sometimes above certain value is is considered positive, or this within this range is is considered negative. Oh my god, you can hear my bird. I'm so sorry. That's a nice bird. <laughs> my bird's just going off. No. But anyway, so depending on what the management calls for, which uh we have to abide by that. So only in that aspect that changes. But for the most part, the computer still does the analysis. Mm -hmm. I hope you heard a word. <laughs> I heard, I heard, we heard quite a bit. Oh my God. But it's a nice sounding bird. <laughs> okay, you can hear it every day. Oh, but so yeah. Sandy, how, about, how about you? Um, how do you use mathematics in your work? For me, maths is all dollars. <laughs> That's very important. Uh, either, how much, either how much we are spending or how much, how much I have left in the bank versus uh, how much am I paying everyone? Do I have enough money to pay everyone? <laughs> what is, how much money should I raise now? So for me, it's all Excel's budget finance right now. But I think Kimberly brought out one point, which is as scientists, when we kind of entered into pure biology or pure science, we left maths behind. Um, in fact, one of the things I, when I started PhD was I had no clue about statistics. Like I didn't know how to do statistical analysis. I mean, everybody was relying on Excel, but I wanted to know how Excel does it. Like, why, why are you even doing it? And um, I did like an online statistical course because there's nothing else available to do. Um, I'm, I don't enjoy math as much, um, honestly, but I've realized that it's there for every part of whatever you're doing. It's very, very important. Either you're comparing, either you're counting, you're subtracting, whatever it is. Um, but right now, Excel's my best friend <laughs> and, and a couple of accounting softwares. But um, my, whole of my day runs a lot around numbers. So everything from fundraising to what's your cash flow versus what's your profit and loss statement going to look like? When are you going to make money? Oh, you've raised $20 million. When are you going to break even? Like I've never heard a word break even five years back. <laughs> right. And then I had to learn what was financial break even in a business. So um, yeah, I've been learning a lot of math. I think it's day in and day out. And I'm thankful to calculators being there, honestly. Wonderful. So, so I think, yeah, so I, I mean, I was, when I asked that question, I was actually thinking more of statistical analysis of data and stuff like that. But you brought us back to something very important, right? We still need to figure out how our balance sheets are working. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so for those of you who just joined us, we are listening to the panel discussion um, on women in science and technology. We've got four very wonderful panelists uh, with us today. Um, so if you have any questions, you may put them in the chat um, in the Q&A and we would come to Q&A in a very short while. Um, and I'm just going to ask our speakers some more questions. So um, my question to all of you actually is, um, what would be your advice to young girls who aspire to enter the STEM industry? And uh, maybe we can start with Mohana first. Um, I think I would have to say firstly that we're very, very blessed to be born in Singapore, that opportunities are just at our fingertips and we can just pursue whenever we want and even do a switch area whenever we want, right? So for that very reason, I think while, while you have the opportunities presented to yourself, I think you owe it to yourself to drive towards the passion that you want. And it's not so common to, I, I think it's still not so common to find women in STEM, especially in the engineering mathematical field. And 
just don't be intimidated intimidated by it because uh though it's a male dominated industry i think at the end of the day your work speaks for yourself so just focus on that and get your work done you don't need to please anyone yeah how about you sandhya i think for me um I think STEM is everywhere around us. It's in the air that we breathe, the chair that we sit, the computer that we are using, um, the money that we pay, the calculations that we do. So I think I've covered STEM. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think it's everywhere. So if you don't, I mean, you sh you should be inspired by it. I I was always inspired by how things work, and that's why I entered into science. Like, why is this the result of something, and how does it get to point A to point B? Uh, was my question always. So that was kind of what, what inspired me to enter the science and the biology. For me, it was more on the human body, right? Why, why mm -hmm. do we fall sick and what that bacteria does to you or the virus does to you and what's the end product and how do you treat it and so on. So I would just say, just go for it. If you like sciences, I think it's one of the best fields to be in. Um, I think it's the most rewarding, most um, like every every day after ending my work uh, or whatever, I, I don't end my work, but after ending my day, uh, it's more like I, I have this personal satisfaction that I've tried something, I've looked at something and it's getting me closer to that point B from point A. Um, so I think that's what pushes all of us as well. Yeah. Awesome. Um, Kimberly? Um, yeah, I think I would say something similar, which is to figure out what excites you and go for it. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, other things that need to sort of, you know, take care of themselves details, but that finding what you like and doing it every day is um, a privilege and a joy. And so, you know, whether that's how you, what you're studying in university, what you do for your career down the road, if you wake up every day excited to go to work and look at stem cells or, you know, help um, solve a pandemic or, you know, engineer us out of problems, that that's a, um, a great joy. And, you know, so one thing I often tell my students when they're trying to figure out, well, wh which thing am I most excited about? Because sometimes there's lots of things. And I have said, well, you know, when you're surfing the internet or like, you know, TikTok or whatever it is, you know, that you're like spending time in, what do you click on? Which science thing gets your attention and makes you click to the next thing? And that's what you're intrinsically excited about. So think about that and then, you know, follow that path and see where it takes you. Wonderful. Sirin, how about you? Yeah, so it's it's great overview already from not trying to understand or trying to be curious about what the, how things work and uh, from the, the science point of view. But since I actually, I want like to extend that. So it's not, uh, the world isn't just about finding out what uh, it is. And then we can also try to improve that. Take what science know and then make it into a, a tangible solution in uh, in life and help with the diagnostic tools, for example, right? So we learn what this microbes virus is doing and then how can we actually develop tools to actually detect them? So that's where engineering comes in. So then I think there, there are a lot of other uh, permutations that people can actually double in. And then if you are not so sure about it, give it a try. And I think that's important, but just to, uh, you don't know until you really try it, right? So then I think that's important. Uh, to to give STEM a try, and then and then you'll you'll find out whether you really like it or not. Then you know you can use the the, the tips from Kimberly, Sandhya, and Mohan, and then uh, and see what uh, will drive you forward. All right. So while we're waiting for questions to come through, um, we're going to go into our rapid fire questions. Um, so I'll just ask um, questions to you, which um, which I hope would 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 put you in the spot. Not just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Sirin, uh, can you share with us what is one piece of scientific news that happened this year? I mean, twenty twenty that thrills you. Mm. <laughs> Gotta be COVID pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> That you? <laughs> as of yesterday, it was GameStop, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about, okay, Sandhya, which would you prefer? Uh, would you prefer going to space or going inside the human body? Inside the human body. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no questions, like no question for <laughs> hands down that. <laughs> So have you read um, Isaac as the most fantastic voyage? Yes, I have. And I've been to the human body experience at Science Center and loved it hands down. Like my son <laughs> enjoyed it. 
<laughs> okay, and, and since we're with you, Sandhya, we have a question um, for you from Abhirup Day. Um, and the question is, as an entrepreneur and a person in STEM, how important is it for a STEM person to switch to a business or dabble into it if they intend to step into entrepreneurship in the future? And there's a follow-up question, but maybe we can get into this one first. Sure. Um, so I think depends what you want to do. If you want to become an entrepreneur in the future, I think you have to kind of know or decide at some point whether you want to run the business of the company or you want to do the research and be kind of the head of tech or head of research and so on. So in my case, I definitely knew I didn't want to be the CTO or the chief scientific officer or a head scientist of a company. I wanted to do the business side of things. Um, so more on business development, fundraising, all of that. So if I wanted to do that, then I definitely needed a business experience because I couldn't have done it without that. Because I would have come and started the company. I wouldn't have known head from tail. I wouldn't have known how to fundraise. And investors ask you these questions. They are like, what background do you have in business that you have put yourself as a CEO or the business head or whatever it is? You don't, you, you don't and investors are brutal, right? So they can... You, they can kill your confidence and kill whatever ideas you had um, it, it, when you're doing due diligence and pitching to them. So you have to be super strong in your business. So I've, I've been asked questions like, oh, you don't have a business degree per se. So how do you, uh, how did you come up with the idea and how you're running the business? And I said, well, I have, I don't have a business, but I did an MBA on the job, literally, you know, I learned everything day to day and I, I'm much better than an MBA graduate at this point because I've done everything you know, and I've known how to do it. It's all application oriented. And when I give that answer, the investors are like, oh, that makes sense. And they should have seen it before that. But anyways, that, that makes sense. And that's kind of what it is. So if you want to go to the business side of an entrepreneurial journey, then you have to, you have to get some sort of a training before you do that. Yeah. And the question, and I think a follow-up question, which you've kind of partially answered is that, you know, did you face any challenges in starting your entrepreneurial journey as being someone with a STEM background, especially as a woman entrepreneur? Do you, do you have another hour? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can have a shortened version and I'm sure that we can organize another talk. Um, I think everything from being Indian to being a minority to being women to being um, oh, you don't have a have a degree from Harvard or or whatever. Oh, you don't have any U.S. experience. To you've only been in Asia. To what's wrong with you? You don't have any IP yet. Uh, why did you quit your well-paid job and start a crazy company? You've never even tried growing stem cells from shrimp. To not finding a lab space. To not finding people to hire. All of it. So I've seen all of it, and I've gone through all of those challenges, and I have a lot more now <laughs> in front of me. But I'm pretty excited to kind of uh, uh, overcome them. Yeah, you should you should start a blog and write about all of this. I'm sure you will get a lot of people reading it. <laughs> I do so on my LinkedIn. I, I write on my LinkedIn. Yeah. Yes. So, so we know we know how to get all this advice from you as well. Uh, Mohana, we have a question for you. How do you manage a modeling career and your day job? Okay, so I guess the question could then change to night job because I had intentionally chose to work a permanent night shift so that during the day I could get any gig done if I have to. And on top of that, I have another project that's, um, that I'm working on and I'm very excited about it because I am passionate about the environment and I'm looking for ways to, to encourage for people to be more, to go for a more greener life. It is, I think it's very, it's very difficult for us to achieve it 100% because we are all very busy and caught up with our daily lives that this would seem and has seem a hassle for us to achieve. So for the most part, I am looking at ways where I could uh, almost inspire people to uptake that lifestyle, so to speak, to a certain percentage. So, so as, because any amount of, any amount of a person going green is a, is a huge impact in, in, in a bigger picture. So that's what I do during the day. And then at night, I work in the lab. So that's how I maximize my day. It's a bit taxing, but I, I'm still alive. So I'm, I think I'm doing well. So the answer to that will be sleepless. <laughs> <laughs> Sleep when you can in the bus, traveling. <laughs> All right. Um, Kevin, we have a question for you. Know, you. Here and there. Um, do you, 
do you think um, one day we can accomplish a level of gen uh, gender equality that would remove the need for initiatives such as women at NTU? That to me, or to Syrian, I couldn't. Uh, to Syrian, actually, this one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Kimberly, feel free to add. <laughs> feel free, Kimberly, to come in and then. Uh, <laughs> we, yeah, so Kimberly and I, uh, we co chair the uh, women at NTU, we co founded it, actually. And uh, of course, that's the, uh, the hope is that one day we don't need such initiatives anymore, for, certainly. But I think at this time, we still need to, to kind of bring a depth awareness and, uh, and ensuring that the equity, equality, and inclusiveness is there, are there. Mm. Uh, Kimberly, we have a question for you as well. Um, so do you feel that there are any different treatment of women in STEM um, in the US and compared to um, Singapore? Hmm. Um, not really. I think there, the issues that women face in STEM are, are quite similar in both places. And that's not so surprised. I mean, the, the fear in Singapore is very similar to, you know, any city of this size in the United mm -hmm. States. The one difference I think that does exist is I think the US is a little bit ahead on the timeline of raising the awareness of these issues. You know, some of the things that are being talked about um, around Singapore at high levels, just in, you know, recent times, those were on the radar of people a while earlier in the United States. So um, we're, I think, a little bit behind here, but, um, but the conversations and the issues are, are identical, really. Wonderful. So before we close today's session, um, I would like to ask all of you my favorite question, uh, which is who's your favorite female scientist and why? So maybe we can start with Sandhya. Oh, wow. You put me on the spot. I have, to, <laughs> I have a few names left. <laughs> I think uh, microbiologists out there, like famous. Currently, in fact, it's actually um, a professor at Duke University called Anne-Marie Chako, whom I met along with Serene. So Serene as well, and then Kimberly as well. I know Kimberly and I haven't interacted too much personally, but I know her a lot because some of her PhD students are my friends. So that's how we know each other. So I would say any scientist that I meet, I'm inspired by. Uh, whichever position they are at, I, did, I mean, it doesn't matter, but I'm inspired by what they are, what they're doing and what they're achieving on a daily basis. Beautiful. Uh, Mohana, who's your favorite female scientist? <laughs> I think I'll date this back to when I was much younger, uh, Jane Goodall. Uh, yeah, I'm very passionate. Of, I mean, I admire her love for, for nature, for the animals. And I think that's something as human beings, as we evolve, we've been so out of tune because yeah. of uh, just, just advancement, right? Uh, in in the mankind, so I think watching Jane Goodall in her element makes me realize that we need we still need to preserve that the the we need to preserve how we view nature and how we should protect Mother Nature. Yeah, so Jane Goodall. Yeah, and actually that synergizes a lot with some of your environmental passions as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Sirin, how about you? So I have. Uh... My all-time favorite, which uh, actually is more like a role model rather than a mentor and all these things, uh, Marie Curie, it must be her. <laughs> I think that the uh, one thing that she actually said, uh, which we as a scientist often forgets, actually uh, all is in the for the beauty of science when you do it. So I think that's sort of like some a reminder for, for, mo for me at least uh, that when we are doing it and we had really hard, uh, you know, facing the hard wall, and that's sort of like, okay, why are we doing this? So it's like, sometimes it's just not for, for money, it's not for, for fame, it's not for all, but it's for the beauty of science, yeah. And of course, beyond that, we have also, <laughs> we have also this beautiful younger scientist and, and entrepreneur, which is really, uh, the, the inspiration comes not from the one who has gone before us, but the one who comes after us. And like, Sandhya has been really well. I've, I've known her since she was a graduate student and it was, really impressive what she's achieved in the last five years. So I really want to applaud her for that. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, Kimberly, how about you? Yeah, I, I'm like the others here, I, or at least Siren, who can't 
and Sandhya, who can't pick a favorite scientist. <laughs> but I will say that the scientists I'm most excited about right now um, are the two female Nobel Prize winners in last year. So Manuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for their CRISPR work, which of course is founded in microbiology. So I think that for the microbiology world, they are amazing role models. They are, they speak out about diversity and inclusiveness in science. And so I think they're pretty awesome right now. Wonderful. So um, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this brings us to the end of our panel discussion or as part of Discover, and we met four amazing women who are working in um, STEM. We have um, Dr. Sandhya Sriram. She is the CEO and co-founder of Shop Meat and an enthusiast to sell base crustaceans, um, you know, and, and to bring them to the market. We have Associate Professor Sirin Lemsh, who is the founder of Biomedical Engineering Society student chapter at NTU Women. Uh, she was awarded the Singapore 100 Women in Tech in 2020. Uh, we have Ms. Mohana Prabha, who is a medical technologist for COVID-19 labs and who was also crowned the Miss Singapore Universe 2019, um, an advocate of diversity and is supported to draw attention to global warming. And finally, we have Professor Kimberly Klein, the co-chair of Women of NTU and a researcher in the field of microbiology. So thank you so much to all of you for sharing your stories with us and thank you for being a wonderful audience. Over to you, Evelyn. Okay, thank you very much for the lively dialogue session. With that, we have of the Discover webinar. Once again, a big thanks to our four panelists and our moderator for making this webinar session possible. Before you leave, please do share your feedback with us via the link shared in the chat or by scanning the QR code. Thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you at the Discover on-site programs and at Discover's webinar next year. Goodbye.